Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. Let me, let me go over some of the updates in refractory cases. And Boaz RZ is the head researcher at UC Davis, and he has been looking at regenerative medicine for treating these for quite some time. Regenerative medicine being autologous temp, uh, stem cells from the patient. And they have just uh, gotten sponsorship in the next, in the last 18 months to two years for a company who is going to be doing uh, some of the production of the diagnostic materials that are needed to make sure that we're using uh, the correct subset of cases that don't respond to full mouth extractions in order to treat with stem cells and also the process patented for stem cell production and that has they have gotten the approval for all that and so that's in in full-blown activity mode right now so they are gallant uh, therapeutics is the one that's doing some more research on this and they should have some definitive answers as far as the cause of stomatitis here within the next 18 months to two years to document their findings so let me go over really quickly what their findings are as far as the cause this is probably of interest to everyone. So we do know that there's a strong evidence based on the research that Boaz has done. And this is updated yesterday. I had an email conversation with him yesterday on updates on this. So they have in the past identified what they call a Puma foamy virus. And if we have that present in conjunction with Khaleesi virus, which appears to be the primary cause in inciting an auto inflammatory, auto rear inflammatory condition in these cats. So Khaleesi causes the inflammatory autoimmune condition. And if the foamy, the Puma foamy virus is present, then that in itself with Khaleesi make the stem cell treatment for the refractory cases, not an option as it appears now, because those cases do not respond in their experience to stem cell therapy. Cases that do not have the foamy virus, and also they're looking at immunological subsets as well, that they're keying, especially in this research, to determine which of these patients would actually benefit from stem cells, and then they will be able to provide stem cells to cure uh, these patients that have the correct subsets and don't have uh, the foamy virus. So it's, it's really exciting from that standpoint. So uh, we're so happy that Boaz RZ and his team at UC Davis are up on this and have been putting all their effort into this for several years because this really impacts these patients that suffer for quite some time. So we're so happy with that. I must stress that the tr any treatment that we're talking about, any treatment that we talked about in this actual case, the treatment with the stem cells I just mentioned, none of that is applied to patients that have teeth and because the autoimmune is due to the plaque on the teeth. If the teeth aren't there, none of those things work. Extractions, full mouth extractions in 99 plus percent of the cases is the first and only recommendation that you should have to a patient that walks in and you recognize this problem. There's, you can use medications to help them, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes with some of the questions that we had, but it, there, there's no treatment that will help long-term without full mouth extraction. So I wanna make that clear. All right, so let's go to the next question. Janie Rodriguez Dufresne, what are the recommendations for these cats as far as the meds before we get them in for extractions and referral? And that's a great question. 
Janie, a lot of these cats you're not going to be able to do day one. As we talked about CRIs, we, in our practice, get them the same day, but you as the practitioner are going to see these, you're going to recognize them. You can't do them the same day or you can't get referral the same day. So we want to do something that's going to help these patients. The biggest thing that does help is prednisolone and preferably oral prednisolone at reasonable doses, one to two milligrams per kilogram BID to start uh, to really impact that inflammation, really impact their eating if they're not eating and really impact their discomfort and inflammation in general, and then decrease that into an every other day regimen. You can add anything to that. Gabapentin is a staple for this because it's a chronic, it's for chronic pain. We don't know exactly how that works, but from, from that standpoint for oral pain, but we do feel that it decreases the release from the presynaptic membrane of substance P and some other substances that are causing more frequent and more intense pain to reach the, the cortex from the brainstem. From that standpoint, gabapentin, prednisolone, orally, we don't like to use depo. Sometimes you have to, but it's not something you want to use multiple times. If you have to get this patient where it's comfortable and administration is an issue, then you need to consider that, but that's a very last resort. Other analgesics we've discussed, that would be the recommendation. And once those meds start, once you see that patient for the first time, get these guys started. That's an action step immediately to get these guys started on the road, to get to somebody, whether it be you or referral, to get that, the other's extraction done. Melinda, are there any ways to avoid ocular trauma during nerve blocks? And we'll talk about nerve blocks specifically a little more in some of the cases as we go through, but in cats, the, um, recommendation is to do the infraorbital block, just like you do in dogs for the rostral premolars and the incisors and the canine. You don't go all the way back. You just go right into the foramen, just barely into the foramen. You don't do the caudal maxillary block like we do in dogs, because that'll put you right at the orbit and knowing the right technique. So we teach that in level one. I've, and we also have a level one virtual where you are in your practice and you're practicing that on cadavers along with Annie Mills, who is my technician of 13, 14 years, I think going forward in July. And she has, she's the best instructor out there in my opinion for the entry level and that's for vets and techs. So it's a great course online or live. So now if you want to post that, we've got a link, I think later on, but if you want to post, that would be great. Man, I'm just watching the clock. We got about seven more minutes. So let me get through some of these other questions. Rhett, Andy Mortensen. This is going to be a short question. Have you used Noceta in replacing bupivacaine in cats? And there is very little information, even with my specialty colleagues, on whether this is something that we want to use. A very expensive. And it is, there's not a lot of proven benefit from this. I have one colleague, John Hupp, who I know uses it in his practice. And he is very satisfied with it. He works in a multiple doctor, especially practice, and they use it. And it's, it's very effective in his hands, but most of my colleagues do not on the specialty level. So we certainly can't recommend it at this point. Great question, but so I can answer that a little bit more specifically. I see in the extraction video, you use an air syringe to clear blood. Have you had any concerns about causing embolus on this exposed bone? And this is from Cathal Rafferty and Cathal. When we use the air water syringe or the air, we do not, we use the air water obviously with our birth and that's to cool the burr when we use the air water syringe. We don't directly put air up into and toward the bone. We want to direct it away. The chances of air embolus are probably little to none, but it has occurred in humans. It has occurred in veterinary patients. So you do want to be careful. 
uh, with uh, the, the more common problem would be where we have uh, emphysema, where we get collection of air uh, that traverses the tissue planes and ends up generally going dorsal because air is light. So it goes through the tissue planes and ends up on the top of the head, can go, can go to the neck uh, as well. And you get that, that crinkly sound when you pet the patient. You definitely want to let the owner know if you do encounter that. It's very infrequent. We do a lot of cases in our practice and we almost never, and they're all dentistry, and we almost never see that. But when we do, we make sure we let the owner know it's just a, just a side effect complication that's untoward in dentistry and it's not a big deal. It'll resolve in a couple of days. In the neck, you got to be a little bit more discerning um, because that could certainly be a tracheal tear. So you want to make sure that you're aware of that and do a little bit more reading on that just to make sure you're not doing anything that might involve tracheal tears, especially in cats. I hope you enjoyed this episode. There's a lot of actionable items in there that you can take and use in your practice immediately. So put those to work and enjoy the benefits for the practice lifetime in your dentistry service. So until next week, have a great week. Take care, guys.